play new planes. They were taking lots and lots of pictures. And I saw that as a good thing to do at a meeting. We can kind of get you to, to believe that you're there in 1903 and you're watching the first powered airplane go off the ground. What would that be like? The world has never been the same since. And so we want to do that. That's coming up October 5th, 7 o'clock, right here. And then, for you people who are missing snow, <laughs> get any hands on that? No. All right. uh, <laughs> we have a, a Syracuse University professor, Mark Mulvenier, a geography professor at the Maxwell School, who's going to tell us something about lake effect snow. You may wonder what it is you have to learn, but <laughs> it, it, uh, we'll see. So at any rate, and maybe Mark may get you thinking about moving to Florida. I don't know. Maybe we'll just have to see. At any rate, tonight, I will get up the next slide, the slide presentation, and Linda is going to kind of introduce this project and talk about some things and then she'll give me a chance to talk about some things. And by the way, in case some of you don't know this, Linda and her husband John have celebrated their 50th anniversary. Sandy, and it's um, 
What, what do they use, Sandy? <laughs> oh, it's a quiet one. We'll put the sign out. But she's known for her pies, so I highly suggest that you try one of them. Danielle Conway has been um, kind enough to extend her services to us this evening, and she is helping David with uh, sign language. And David is an expert in lip reading as well, but uh, it's really been fun to have Danielle uh, jump on the wagon and do this. She had a very close classmate and friend that was deaf, and she learned how to communicate with her in high school, and she dropped some of it, but she's picked it right back up, and she is um, our right and left arm because uh, some of the interpreters from the city were not able to come out, so we're eternally grateful to have another local individual in Vegas who does some sign language for us, so thank you for that. <laughs> if along the way there are any corrections, additions, or deletions, we encourage you to raise your hand and, and make it known because historically that's the only way that we get this right and we want this to be uh, correct in every possible way that we can. Um, it's been a little bit of an um, added uh, skill for me to get some of it right with uh, David. So I'm hoping that if uh, his son that I'd like to introduce now, David uh, Jr., would you stand up? And his lovely wife, Marie. <laughs> Their daughter, Tammy. Uh, lives in Virginia and is heartbroken that she could not be here this evening, but most certainly will get a CD tour. Now, uh, David Jr. Uh, has been able to text, and wow, has that helped me, because I've been able to really communicate and get a few more uh, clear answers from him, and that's been great. We'll make it informal. Uh, we are not going to show the slideshow again until uh, we have completed our program, and then we're going to ask you to help perhaps identify, or better identify, and if you have uh, been kind enough to bring in photos of any kind, pictures of any kind, cartoons of any kind, we deeply appreciate it. This has been overwhelming to us, and Chuck has worked diligently to get them recorded, and uh, we have really tried hard to make sure that we have all of the uh, names correct on most of the photos. If you have questions, we're going to try to answer them for you. There's been so much sharing that that's what it's it's all about, and uh, we we have just been thrilled to be able to uh, bring this local uh, talent uh, to all of you tonight. David, um, I think. Uh, needs to have a little bit of background sharing uh, about how he began his uh, career. He's very, very humble. He did not want this to happen, I don't think. So it took me a few visits to encourage him to let this be um, a piece of our history. It's a story that needs to be told. It's a story of perseverance, it's a story of talent, a story of respect, and a story of someone who cares about Fabius, the village, the town, and the life that he lives. About a year ago, I visited David, and in our uh, off and on conversations over the years with he and Mary, his wife, and others, he would often mention uh, that he painted murals in school. And it just fascinated me that he had murals somewhere in a school in the city that I don't think anyone here knew about. Certainly we did not have documentation of it, nor did we have a pictorial uh, opportunity to even see what they were. So I asked David if he would be willing to let me call his school, the school that he attended for a period of time called Percy Hughes. And he said, 
Yes, it's okay. I said, if I contact them and they allow us to come in and your murals are still there, are you willing to go with me? And he's, he just burst with pride. And absolutely. And I think he was ready to see them again himself. And I was more than thrilled. So I called Sandy Beglinger, our president. I said, grab a camera. I have an appointment. They're going to meet us in the foyer. And as many of you know, schools have changed, so we had to go through um, a clean out and a lock up and a scrub down before we were able to get in. But I then found out where Percy Hughes School was. We were greeted on the front lawn by six or seven deer. We entered and uh, we were met by a lovely lady called Mary. They were having um, somewhat of a disturbance in the school system that day, so we were not able to go into any of the other classrooms or any of the art areas that I had hoped that we could do. But standing in the foyer in a small short walk up the hallway was the most unbelievable sight of murals that you could imagine done by a 16-year-old student. Not sure if um, we can put those up right now. Um, Chuck, for now. This will give you just a little, little flavor because the murals were on four walls. Now, this was um, spring, summer, winter, and fall. And he used his own imagination along with the Vegas Creek, along with Hodgeback, along with the churches, along with a little bit of everything that came from the village and the town of Fabius on these four murals. And I said to him, David, what, what does that um, covered bridge stand for? I just like covered bridges. <laughs> so he added a covered bridge. But on one side of the wall, they had completely taken down um, the mural that we had hoped to really get to see. This is one of the clearer pictures that we have, and we're in the process of trying to locate something a little bit better. But this, this when you get a chance, you can see closer. But this is what the mural that was taken down. It has the church in it. It has the village in it. It has some of the stores in it. And so it was disappointing that we couldn't see this particular one. But the other murals were very, very clear and very much uh, amazing to uh, look at and to describe. Is there another uh, photo at all of that? Uh, it comes later. Okay, then we'll just hold on. We'll see it later. But just keep your eyes peeled because. Uh, it, it really was amazing that we were able to uh, get in to see those. So, when we finished uh, with the murals, minus one, this happened so many years ago that I said there must be a whole lot more going on with Mr. David. And there was, and I found out a lot about his background. He was born on a homestead on Keeney Road, Keeney Settlement Road, and he's one of five brothers. Russell, Eugene, Burton, <coughs> Leland, and David. His parents were Tom and Ruth Glasgow Pilcher. And by the way, his birthday's coming up real soon, and I said to him, uh, do you mind if I ask how old you might be? I old. <laughs> I said, I older. <laughs> so he told me that our birthdays were both in October and he will be 71. So we began slowly. This was a year ago, May. He showed me many pictures. He, uh, I said, do you have a picture of what your farm looked like? So the next time I came, he found a photo 
that he had painted of his farm. This is what his homestead looked like on Keeney Settlement Road. This is just a little bit different view and hard for you to see, but we're going to have them for you afterwards to, to look at. So these were, uh, these were the young years that uh, David spent at home. When David was about one and a half, he lost his hearing in his left ear due to German measles. Even though he had profound hearing loss, he continues to be and is a great lip reader. Believe me, I know. Sandy and I decided that maybe we ought to just talk to some of his friends that are still around since much of his family was uh, spread apart and his brothers were uh, not close enough for us to question. Uh, so we decided to call Royce Root. Can we have a picture of Royce Root? Back, back that up just a minute, Chuck, for, uh, for just a second with David, um, all of David's. Is he one cutie patootie or what? <laughs> I said, you were the cutest darn kid. So th these are just uh, uh, school pictures and small uh, young pictures of David before and when he went into uh, Percy Hughes. And then we, you can go ahead, Chuck, and then just, just an FYI, on the farm, he had a few cows with his family, he had a few cows, um, a few chickens, and they had a horse. And he loved the horse. Okay, go ahead. And, well, he was a happy, smiling guy anyway. We're going to work on this in a minute. We bypass that and go right to Roy's room. So we said, well, let's call Royce. Well, it was the right thing to do. Because Royce and his wife, Belda, Belda, wave your hand. Uh, Royce, Royce could not be here tonight, uh, but Velda is, and they graciously opened their home, and we spent well over an hour interviewing uh, Royce, and we learned quite a bit about Mr. David. He hung around with the Partridge Boys. Is Donnie here? Yeah, Donnie, you might as well admit it. The horse's name was Rose, by the way. Oh, what was it? Yeah, see? We're, learning, we're going to learn a lot more tonight. Jack Dennis, David Leach, Rick Hathaway, Royce Root, and I think there were several others that probably don't want to be named for fear of, of some of the troubles that they might have gotten into down there in the creek off of Keeney Settlement Road. But they all pretended to be cowboys. Well, then that got kind of tiring. Because David really wanted to be Davy Crockett. So they built a canoe. They had a canoe. Then David and his brother Leland built a little hut down there. So these boys would um, go down there and, and uh, play Cowboys and Indians or Davy Crockett because David had a coon hat. And that's what he wanted to be was, he really wanted to be an Indian, I think. That's where I got through really talking to him quite a bit. And these boys would uh, ride the canoe up and down the creek when they were supposed to be uh, in the barns helping their chores. And sometimes they'd stay overnight in this little camp site that they made, and they'd have um, fires and uh, roast themselves up a little something to eat that they probably snuck from mom's worthy kitchen. David uh, was just so happy to be with the boys and have playmates, and the boys were so happy to have him do an early tattoo. Now, I know tattoos are 
in style. Well, I won't show you mine. I don't have one. But anyway, back then, those boys knew he could draw cartoons and knew that he could draw pictures. So he would draw pictures and cartoons on their arms. And those boys just kept teasing him to keep drawing pictures all the time. And he did. As a matter of fact, his mother shared in an article that David, the very minute that he held a pencil in his hand, started doodling and drawing. Thus became his world. His schooling began as well as his love for drawing. David went to um, Fabius for a while, and then he went to Percy Hughes in Nottingham. Let me just share a couple of articles. These you may um, not remember, but this one was in um, our local paper when we wrote about um, local artisans back in 1987. We have an article from 1961, and we have an article from 1974. In 1987, uh, uh, these were the things that, that uh, David was able to share with us to be able to put into the school newsletter. At ages 5 through 10, he drew cowboys, Indians, and farms with pencils, crayons, and chalk. He didn't really care what he used as long as he was drawing. He attended Fagus School from third grade through sixth grade. Now, some of that time, he was, I don't know if some of you here remember it, because I do very well. Uh, we were so overcrowded in the war times that uh, school was held in the Methodist Church. And uh, that's where David um, was uh, in some of his schooling years was in the church. He shared that with me as well. Then he went to Percy Hughes School for hearing handicapped children. It was there that he met Mary. And most of you uh, might know or may not know that Mary, too, had a handicap. And they became boyfriend, girlfriend. They later married. And that was a, a pretty neat little love story that happened at Percy Hughes. She was uh, 19, I believe, when they got married. He went to Nottingham High, Hughes Nottingham uh, High School for half days for two years for classes just in art. And mainly that art was watercolor. Then he studied famous artist cartoon courses for three years at home. And he received many certificates and many, many recognitions. And that's where Chuck's going to take over and share uh, with you a lot about his uh, cartooning. His career as an artist started with painting murals at the Kinlock restaurant. Do any of you remember the Kinlock and Manlius? Well, that's where he started doing murals. Then he did, uh, and there he did pictures of, uh, of old railroads and, and uh, stations of New York City. He drew uh, the Four Seasons, as we shared with you, and he also did a lot of work at Toggenburg. He drew many murals, he drew several down there, and did a lot of artwork for all of the um, um, hickeys. And, Mr. Hickey, most especially, uh, thought the world of David. And uh, it was a great loss to David when he uh, passed away because much of his work was uh, really appreciated, certainly by, uh, by them. So he and his wife uh, had two children, Tammy and uh, David Jr., and they both are graduates of the U.S. County School. Uh, let me just share this uh, little article from uh, the newspaper, Syracuse newspaper, about um, Percy Hughes School of David. The Percy Hughes School is getting brighter inside, they said. The painting of the murals by David W. Pilcher 
in the four seasons and the bare walls and the hallways remain amazing. He is a former student of uh, Percy Hughes and donated his time and his materials for this project. Again, they shared that he was born in Vegas, right there on the homestead, and transferred to Percy Hughes in Nottingham. And again, his work is done in inks, charcoals, watercolor, acrylics, uh, portraits he's done, commercial art he has done. Primarily, he did all the studying on his own, except for when he went to um, the school for um, cartoon. The teacher at uh, Percy Hughes could not get over how talented he was at such a young, young age. She saw such potential in him that uh, his, his imagination, his descriptives of what he could do and what he wanted to draw were uh, pretty amazing. He, was a, he had, certainly had natural ability. David's teachers um, were, were impressed with every drawing that he did because he did it to detail and he loved corrections. I think one of the things that um, made David um, be so likable is the ease of accepting um, feedback. And if he didn't do something right, for sure it didn't bother him. He was able to um, come right back and take care of whatever uh, they suggested. And he was uh, part of uh, the Everson Museum group. I mean, he, he just he just did so much in his young life that it was uh, really fun to learn and to talk to these people at these schools. Just like to uh, show just a little bit of um, his, uh, from his homestead, he, they moved to Parker Road. Do we have that one on there at all? Chuck, do you know? Close by. Um, okay. Uh, for most of you that know where Parker Road is, it's now where the Aikens live. And Parker Road is, is in the, the back side of, of where all the um, um, ball fields are. And he and his family moved there, and then he and Tammy, or he and uh, Mary uh, bought the house, and they lived there for five years. And then he's lived here in the village for well over 35 years. So we have um, pictures of uh, his place on uh, Parker Road that um, happens to be on one of these tables close by, so you can get to look at that as well. We um, got a real kick out of, and you'll see those in, in the slideshow, a real kick out of most of uh, the paintings that had the creeks in them were the creek where it was Fabius Creek, where he, in fact, spent much of his time um, just uh, loving to walk with it and, and be by it and uh, draw uh, anything that had uh, the water near him uh, in that creek. So you'll see uh, some uh, pictures and some photos of uh, certainly the creek down here on uh, Parker Road. His grandfather, and if you look directly to the table on the very back, you'll get a chance to see it up close. But that is his grandfather, and that is um, a painting that um, David did. And then next to his grandfather is a painting that his grandfather did. Now, that doesn't have a specific meaning. It was just a painting that his grandfather did years ago. So it's really neat to see those uh, two uh, side by side. And he was pretty proud of uh, having uh, a little bit of that art from his uh, grandfather and the taste and the flavor of wanting to carry that on. So uh, certainly his, his grandfather remained very well and had quite an influence on, on him. So that gives us just a little bit of a background of uh, where David lived and how we uh, became fortunate enough to um, get him to agree for this evening and for uh, the rest of us, it's a lot of history.
because Chuck's going to talk about the cartooning. And it just got better and better and better. He left the cartooning and started using acrylics and watercolor. And you can tell as you walk around the room some of the early uh, pictures that, that he uh, did. And then you can tell uh, some of the later pictures of, of homes that he has done and just the transition of a young boy and the love of wanting to do this work and how it uh, came to fruition in his life and, and the joy that he brought so many of us because he, yeah, I sell. Okay, a little bit. Okay, you know. And he just didn't realize what amazing, amazing talent he had until uh, he got uh, quite a bit older and we were able to say, David, beautiful job, amazing work, and you need to be recognized. So we know that there are several other people in this community as well that are artisans and do beautiful work, but David's had to persevere many, many things in his life, and um, we're just thrilled to be able to make this part of our history and part of our um, continuing uh, legacy here so famous. cartooning and they claimed 
that they had in the cartooning school some really well-known cartoon artists. See if you know these names. Norman Rockwell. Ring a bell? Uh, Al Cap. He did Little Abner years ago. Milton Caniff. At some point, these people had something to do with the school. And so here it is, and this particular letter, I think, is one of the first ones that he got, sort of saying, welcome, we've got your first contribution, and what he was doing for three years was doing the assignments and sending them in. And then after three years, this letter arrived, and this letter is telling you, it is a great pleasure to sign the certificate showing you have completed the famous artist course. And indeed, I think they even in the paper, they even gave you grade point out of your grade, and it was a B plus. Which I think with a school like this, that's really pretty good. Now, what kind of art can we expect? <coughs> and here's a good example of that. I've looked through a good many of your cartoons, and I enjoyed them, and I recommend them. But let me tell you this, what I think what you did is amazing, because what you did is to make a cartoon that conveys a lot of information without words, or few words. Now, if I were teaching a course in creative writing, heaven forbid, if I were to teach a course in creative writing, I could say, hey, class, what's the story? Write a story about this. And it would be a challenge. And the good students could do it. Because you can see. You can see there's something happening. Well, you want something happening? What about this? Ozark in. Ozark in. <laughs> Does this bring back any memories? Do you think you're in this picture? A uh, band, by today's standards, is relatively well-dressed. <laughs> the students, if they are students here, uh, young people are relatively well-dressed, and it looks like they're having fun. And what I, I'm amazed when I look at this is how you took relatively few lines and put out so much information using a very, relatively small amount lines and color and so forth. There's the date, 1962. About the time he's finishing the cartooning course. Well, suppose we go to the prom. And it looks a little better. But look at the faces. We're going to see more complex faces, but look at the faces. It's like as you look at each person, you can begin to say, I think I know what they're thinking or what they're doing or what's going on. <coughs> Let's take a look at what he did for three years. Sending in the assignment, sending in a picture. And then the teacher puts a piece of art paper over that and then makes a whole lot of little suggestions, redrawings and so forth. And I guess you benefited from that, that you learned from that. Well, that's the picture. What did he draw? And there's your part of it. <coughs> now, did your kitchen ever look like that? Would you have something to say if your kitchen looked like that? facial expressions. Look at hers. I don't know. I think she's going to need medication. <laughs> it doesn't look good. But something is happening and again, you, you don't see a single word here. Let me try to prove my point to you. I just took this out of the Sunday paper about a week ago. This is one of the most famous cartoons ever. Charles Schultz has been gone for a while, but they still run the cartoons. 
They still sell merchandise. People still recognize these characters. And if you look, I said it's wordy. Word, 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 word. And if you look at the facial expressions, and who am I to criticize? This guy got richer. If you look at the facial expressions, it's all, it's, they're so much alike. And the question is, is the guy's tongue sticking out or not? It's like, this is how you tell what's going on in my head coming off here. It is. But you did it. 
and the world wants to keep it and wants to bring it here to show other people. You did. Look at this guy. Now, I look at him, and right away I think, he's worried about something. Now, he's got a few things to worry about. Look at this tree. I don't know if you can see or not, but there's like a couple of eyes and a nose and a mouth down here. He's got a tree looking at him. That could be a problem. Hmm. He's sort of bent over. He's looks like he's from the colonial period. And he's probably worried about something. What's going on? It's like, once again, there's a story. Well, listen, if you want to have a lot of stuff going on, go to war. <coughs> Go to water. And the watercolors are here. And the relatively simple figures in this particular painting are here. And look at all the smoke and look at all the soldiers and look at the sky. The beauty of watercolor where it's like, yeah, we got colors up there, but it's like light is coming through. It's a wonderful thing. Well, I just took a wet guess here and said, well, maybe the Native Americans don't seem friendly. Was it something we said? Wow. Look at all these tomahawks being tossed around in the air, causing damage to people. Yeah. We talk about confessions. This could be a problem. But there's something going on. And it's beginning to combine the watercolor art along with what maybe was the residual of the cat cartooning in the uh, part of things. Uh, this is from uh, Barbara Kinney submitted this, and she thinks it is uh, acrylic. Nixon. 
Nixon. I guess Nixon. I wasn't sure, but I guess Nixon. Okay, there he is. And the guys on the bottom look too good to be Nixon, but who would? No, you don't know. Okay. If you don't know, we don't know. How about this lovely lady and man here? Don't know either. Okay. Oh, my goodness. How did this sneak in here? What, what do you think? Isn't this amazing? This is a guy who's been dead since 1945. Self-inflicted woman. And it's not a portrait, but it's just putting the lines, a few lines, in the right place. And look how many of you know who this is. Oh my goodness, we've got some nudity here. Any children in the audience? The rest of you know about this. And of course, you recognize this guy, so this may help you identify Hitler. As I said, for many of us, for many of us, it's the buildings and the places and the memories. And when you began sending me pictures, and again, thank you for that, when you began sending me pictures, so often it was of your house. Let me show you something here. Recognize that? Yeah, Sonny Goodrich. Let me tell you a story about this. Uh, many, many years ago, or we live right across the road from the Goodrich Farm. And so for many decades, actually, we have had the privilege of looking out the window and seeing this lovely countryside and seeing these lovely buildings. And our daughter, when she was quite small, she went with her grandparents, uh, visited her grandparents in Chicago, and they went to the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. And when she got back, she said, do you realize what I saw there? I said, what? She says, in the agricultural section of that museum, I saw a big mural of the Goodrich Farm. I said, you did? What are the chances of this happening? And I wondered if Sonny knew. So I went to see Sonny Goodrich and I said, to, you know, do you realize you've got, there's a big mural of your farm in the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry? He said, I did not know. I said, how did they get it? And he said, he thinks they took it off the cover of a dairy magazine. So some dairy magazine apparently liked the looks of his farm, put it on the cover, and the museum liked it. He took it and put it on the wall. And Sonny got no money for that whatsoever. <laughs> I do want to tell you this, where Sonny is living now in Cortland, in his bedroom area, he has this picture up on the wall. And he, I think it's comforting to him to see his old farmstead right there on the wall where he is. Well, good retirement. In fact, we've got some more things we can ask you about. I hope you can see the titles here. Recognize that, right? What is it? station, of course. And of course, there was a time when we had around the countryside a lot of train stations. Um, one of the articles I just read for this, that when people would go from uh, from James or uh, Jamesville uh, into uh, Syracuse, it would take the train, 15 minute ride, quick and easy. And so forth. So here we go. How many have seen this building? And you know what it is. Dick, what is it? It's a pole trestle with Moore's X and the feeding building. Yeah. We're on the Moore's X right door down. Yeah. Well, did they? That could be a story there. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, Irene said we did see it, but I don't remember, I don't know, she's probably right. Uh, so someone, yeah, someone apparently tore it down and 
until it's no longer there. But there was a time, as you all know, there was a time when uh, on trains, locomotives were steam locomotives, and they were often powered by coal. And so they had to store the coal somewhere. Um, Jamesville, you can, there is a big colliery there, which they turned into office streets. And by the way, it's for sale. No, I find that. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and this, you know, this is it. But I, I remember some of these beautiful local steam locomotives. And the reason I remember them so well, one of the high points in my life is when I got my first car. It was a cheapie, but it ran. And for the first time, I didn't have to beg for a ride. I could jump in and drive someplace. And my mother began to worry, thinking, he's going to get in trouble. He's going to stay away all night. He's going to do worse than that. And then she said one day, this is my instruction. You will be home at 1 a.m. no later than 1 a.m. every time you go out. You know, folks, it's been a long time since I had any reason to stay out for one day. <laughs> but there were times when I was driving home and thinking about what she was going to say, because she'd always be awake. And there was a steam locomotive in about 100 cars, inching by me. Well, I survived. I survived. I need to do that. Okay, you know where that is, right? You can read that. I don't know. And you do have some you do have some Kyler interesting Kyler here because you got some more Kyler pictures. Now, this is not something that I think you saw at the time. So this is one example where you are going back historically before your life and coming up with some things that make it look very interesting. Uh, a lot of things happening here at this kind of station. Uh, you know this one? That's it. Jamesville Station. Uh, and by the way, at, at Christmas time, they have uh, a very interesting craft sale that's no worth But that was before. Yes, they moved it about 500 feet, yeah. That's right. Yes, there you have it. In fact, I think this is one of the reasons why we appreciate you, because you make some of these memories for us. Now, there was a time when we needed a lot of little buildings like this. Some of you really old timers remember this? You're so young. Uh, nobody knows what this is? Schoolhouse. Yeah. Which schoolhouse? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks old. All right, now here's, we got a couple of memories here, and I don't know if they're correct or not. I read that she, or one of our historic, one of our historic sources was Dwayne Skeel. And I learned so much from him. And we think that Dwayne once said that uh, his mother taught in the school. Is that what you said? That's what you said. And I was thinking, and I may be wrong, I was thinking that at some point he said that he attended. Is that true? This was your grade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, of course. Consolidation occurred, and we were able to get rid of things. Whatever happened to the schoolhouse? Okay, I can believe that. Uh, I think at the time he did. Wayne did tell us you should go look at it, and we did go look at it. And I think at the time it looked very much like that picture. Uh, what about this one? Anybody recognize this? That's it, Ky Kyler Hill. That's it, and uh, here's the building. It's still standing, and next to it, a smaller building, which I suppose could be a woodshed or 
or it could contain also the, what do they say, necessary rooms. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we have gone beyond that point to the federal school. And we think this is the steel sugar house. And Dwayne told me some stories about that. Uh, here, of course, is the Pompey store. And one of the reasons I show you this is because it's an example of using watercolor in a kind of a looser way, in a kind of a dilute way by putting washes on. But if you do it right, you can still make out a great deal of detail here. And again, here's the Fabius, we saw that before. Here's the Fabius Beaver Dam again. This I like, I really do. And the reason is this. It looks to me like it's watercolor. But look at the detail that one can get in watercolor if you know what you're doing. <laughs> and I must admit, I never reached that point in whatever it is I did. To take something like watercolor and put, give detail to it, to me, is amazing. But uh, here you, this is kind of timely, but here's the uh, Ford House. And it is getting some repairs done. I think a lot of them to the roof. But again, look at the watercolor. It kind of, it kind of gives a depth. It kind of gives an interest. And, and yet, there are still some details there. Oh, you got to know what that is. Swan Pond, yeah. A lot of stories about that one. They, a year or so ago, they were getting after somebody because he took the eggs and swans and threw them around and broke them. And now I think they're doing something with the swans and sending them away or whatever they do. Uh, that's the uh, swine pond and man Oh, is this what you're looking for? Okay. Let me tell you a story about this. This lady was looking for this picture and I wasn't sure whether I had it or not because I've been looking at so many pictures. When I got this, <coughs> I looked at so many of David's pictures and I can see that they are things that I recognize. And Irene and I are newcomers. We've only been here since 1971. <laughs> I mean, you guys have been here longer than that. You know? And I thought, is this a real place? I mean, this could be almost any place. And so I, I emailed her back and I said, uh, is this a real place or did he kind of make this up? And she sent me a link to Google Maps so I could see exactly where it was, and I could go there if I wanted to. Okay, we think we found this church. Okay, we, we needed to know where that was. He says, 
Is it up by Izzy Woodford's down in the valley? I think. And they're gone now. Well, we're gonna. We need to try to identify that. So if if anyone really yeah, us know. can give us that historically, we'd like to have that. Yeah. In fact, anything you see here, we're misidentifying things. Let us know. Uh, we've got some from the Driscoll family over here, and these are, to me, just gorgeous. Look at this Fabius Brook. This is the one in the back of your house. Okay. I mean, just done with watercolor. It is just, I think, wonderful. Oh, I, I, I don't want to give you the impression that David here, as an artist, can kind of sit down and communicate with the heavens or something and things flow into his head and he starts to paint. Look at how much detail work is done before he goes to work in some other way, like a painting. And whether it's details about whatever, the fretwork or the, the trim, uh, signs, whatever, colors of things and so forth, it's not, folks, it's not easy being him. That's, I think that's the message. And so, again, you've seen that enough. And you see it. David Pilcher, we salute you and we thank you. Some refreshments, folks. They, uh, Irene and Sandy, do wonderful things.